I hope you guys have enjoyed this end time series. I hope that it's been insightful. I hope that it's been comforting. I hope that it's been encouraging as we are enlightened as to the times that we're living in, but also the things that are to come, which God's word just lays out so clearly in so many ways. I know there's a lot of mystery wrapped up in the end times and the calendar and the order of all the events, but really when you highlight the main thing, Jesus is coming back. He is returning for his church, and I cannot wait until the sky is opened up and we meet him in the air. Before we get going with today's powerful, life-changing message, we just want to make a few quick little announcements. First of all, this morning, it's really important to us that we know who's here and who's not. We want to um, stay connected with you as a church. As we grow, it becomes increasingly difficult, really, to keep tabs on everybody. But we, are, we care so deeply about everybody's individual walk with Christ. And so we do the best we can. We don't always, we don't always hit it. Sometimes we miss people. But we, we're trying to do the best we can to stay connected and to see when people are here and when they're not. Because we know that if people will just get their rear ends in the seats in God's house, in God's presence, around God's people, in the word of God and in worship, that your life will just change. And eventually you're not even going to recognize yourself. So it's really important to us that you check in. So will you please, if you've not done that yet, will you take a moment, get on the Mountain Movers Church app and go to check in. And digitally that will let us know that you're here. Also, you have an opportunity when you do that to put in uh, uh, any different ways that we can pray for you and your family. We don't take that lightly every week. The staff, Misty and myself, we, we pray continually. We, we look over every one of these requests and we pray sincerely that God would touch you in your situation. So we value that. Please take a moment to do that this morning. Also, share hope. If you've been in on this series in the last few weeks, you know the times that we're living in. You know that there's no time that is more important than right now to help people that you know realize that Jesus is alive. He's not in the tomb. He's coming back for his church. And we want to help as many people as we possibly can to be ready. Say ready. ready. We want to help as many people realize what it means to live for God to please God with their lives, and to be ready for his soon coming return. So you can do that by sharing hope this morning on any of our social media platforms. Specifically, Facebook Live is rolling right now. If you have Facebook, get on there and share, share, share. And hopefully there's something that's said today where the Holy Spirit will speak to somebody's heart, to somebody's life, and maybe somebody will come to Christ because you clicked share. Please do that today. Hey, I want to just address something. I, I came to my understanding that a lot of you are having trouble getting on or getting internet in this room to be able to do the things we're asking you to do. So look, can I just tell you we're already on it. We're working on it. We're getting ready to open up a, a network just for you guys. Okay, so if you can't get on right now because you don't know the password... <laughs> I haven't told you what it is. That's because our whole online system is running off the same, and we don't want our online family to get cut out because every one of us click on with our phones. This is their church so experience, is, so we don't want to rip online the rug family. out from under them. So we love you, online family. We love you wherever you're watching from. We're fixing that problem, but I'll just ask you this. When you leave and you get in your car and you do have data, it literally takes 10 seconds to check in. That way we can pray over you during the week, and you can still hit share. Hey, also, how many of you guys know what's going to happen a week from Tuesday? Anybody know? Something you got to live under, a, election under day. a rock. Okay, how about we participate? How many know what's <laughs> happening a week from Tuesday? Raise your hand. Thank you. It is one of the most important elections that's probably happening in our lifetime, all right? So much of why we chose to do this series right now is because of what's happening in the United States mm -hmm. of America and around the world, all right? And so we are going to challenge you with a fasting challenge this week. We do a corporate fast every single month. We've been doing it a little bit differently, and this is the challenge. Beginning Tuesday, we're asking you to take one meal, give up one meal, and actually spend that time during that meal praying, okay? Until the next Tuesday on the day you go in and you vote. And when you vote, we're asking you all week long to pray and sincerely ask God. Because can I tell you something? It doesn't matter what platform you are about. It doesn't matter what, what, whether you are libertarian, Democrat, Republican, or anything else. Can I tell you what matters? Is that you go in and you exercise your right to vote biblical values. The name tied to it makes no difference. What matters as a believer... 
is that you line up with the word of God. And when we as a nation will line up with the word of God, that's when we will be blessed. Second Chronicles 714 says this. I want you guys to highlight this in your word. Then if my people, my people, this does not say all people. This does not say everybody in the United States of America or around the world. It says my people, those who say they know me, those who have accepted me into their heart, my people who are called by my name, if we will humble ourselves and pray and we will seek the face of God and turn from our wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins and restore their land. We're challenging you to fast with us from Tuesday to Tuesday, one meal, and spend that time praying for our nation. Can you do that? Can you do that? I heard one person. Come on, amen, you can do that. You better wake up, because I am fired up this morning, so you better participate, all right? Get with me. All right, final thing, then we're going to dive into part three today. OCC is Operation Christmas Child. That's what all that Christmas stuff is out in the mm -hmm. foyer. Our goal this year is to put 200 boxes in the hands of needy children around the world. Up to last Sunday, we had given 101 boxes away with two weeks to go. We have 99 that need to be picked up. So you can check out one or two or five or ten. You fill them up. You bring them back on November 8th. And these are shipped out around the world to children who will not get Christmas. All right? They would not get Christmas if it isn't for us. And can I just tell you, this is so much fun. I took my two daughters with us into a store. And they spent $80 on two boxes. I was mm -hmm. like, holy cow. I mean, they kept, and then they And found, then practically and had then to they, stand on the boxes to get the lid shut. They shoved it all shut. down, and they literally duct taped it shut. They had so much fun. So this year, they've already got on to me and said, you're not even in the four-year to sign those suckers out. Can we go sign them out? I have no idea how many we'll end up with. But it is so much fun to know you're blessing kids around and, the world. And just so you know, it's a Samaritan's Purse is the organization that distributes these boxes all over the globe. Uh, that's Billy Graham's son, and he, they, they distribute these all over the globe. And when, when these kids open these boxes for Christmas, not only are they getting these great Christmas gifts, and, and you should just see the smiles on their faces, but then followed up with that is a full presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So they have an opportunity to know who Jesus is. The driving force behind everything that we do as we bleed the vision of this church is to help people realize who Jesus is, and that they would come to know that hope in him and make heaven their home. Everything we do points towards people coming to Christ. That's why the church is here. That's our job. That's why we exist. And so you're not just packing a shoebox. You're not just even providing Christmas for a needy child, which sounds like a great, noble cause in itself. But behind it all, you're sharing the gospel of hope with these children who may not ever hear the gospel of Jesus. So Guys, please, get one box, two boxes, five boxes, ten boxes. Let's make that goal. Let's exceed the goal, and let's get those boxes out there. All right. Okay, here we go. We are digging into part three of today's, uh, of this series that we're in called Ready for Anything. The heartbeat behind this series, as Misty said, yes, we're leading up to a, a crucial election in our, in our nation's history. But uh, more than anything, the, the times that we are living in, are the last days the Bible declares. And, and we want you, as your pastors, as those of you watching online, we want everybody to be ready. Say ready. We want you to know what to expect. We want you to know what to anticipate. We want you to be in right positioning to experience the things that are about to come. And so we want you to be ready. The title of today's message is Why a Rapture of the church. If you haven't seen or listened to any of the messages in this series, you really need to go back, especially the first week, because we lay, you know, you might be, you might be hearing some of the things we're teaching, and you might think this is really hard to swallow. This is really hard to believe that Jesus is going to come back and part the clouds, and we're going to be levitated in the air, and we're going to meet. It sounds like a like a really far out there sci-fi film that is just made up. But if you go back to week one, you're going to see where the Bible, uh, all these compiled books written by men of God from thousands of years ago, how the Lord just mathematically laid out dates and times, and these things are happening, and, and we're seeing things happening in our day, prophecies that are coming to pass. There's no way these prophets 
that many years ago would have even had a clue what they were even writing about. They just tried to explain the best they could what they were seeing in their mind. And so it is amazing how the Bible just perfectly puts this picture together of what those times will look like. And let me tell you right now, we are living in those times. These are exciting times to be a part of the church of Jesus Christ. These are exciting times. Jesus is about to come back. So very quickly, I want to share the series text with you. It's Matthew 24 and verse 44. It says this, you also must be what? Ready. Ready. All the time. Why? Because the Son of Man is going to come when least expected. All right? We want you to be ready. We're going to show you a quick timeline. We've done this every service, but again, we just want to help you understand the order of events um, that we believe will transpire and take place as we are entering into these last uh, days um, as the church calls it. So this is the timeline of the end times. We are living in, in what is called the age of grace or the church age. And we believe, as your pastors, we believe that we are at the end of that age and the next big event on God's eschatological, that is a crazy word, but future end time events calendar is the rapture of the church. We're going to get into that today. Then comes seven years of tribulation. We believe that the church will be raptured out of here, and those that remain will be those that did not have a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus that was contagious. They will be here as Satan and the spirit of Satan's son, the Satan's Messiah, will be loosed on the earth to wreak complete devastation and havoc to the people of the earth. After that seven years is up, we believe there will be what is a second rapture, what is called the second coming of Christ. Jesus is going to come back, and then we will enter into the millennial reign, a thousand years where we as the saints of God will rule and reign with Jesus from Jerusalem for a thousand years on planet earth. Then the final judgment, that's where you hear this, the scripture being read, depart from me, you doer of iniquity. I never knew you. I never knew, never had a relationship, not religion, relationship. I never had a relationship with you, so enter now into eternal judgment. By this time, it will be too late. No more grace extended. Final judgment. Then we enter into the eternal age where we believe God brings heaven down to earth and restores earth as he originally intended in the Garden of Eden, and this earth becomes heaven, and we live forever in the presence of Almighty God. Woo! Give it's going to be hand. awesome. It's going to be awesome. I can't wait. You know, I don't know about you and your family, but since we started teaching this series and even before, we've got four teenagers, and we discussed this a lot, a lot, a lot. And you know, it used to be something where it almost seemed like there was a fear kind of gripping their heart, and the more we talk about it, the more I'm seeing smiles on their faces and excitement and a passion to want to share with their friends because they honestly realize that many of their friends are not going to go in this rapture, not unless something changes. And so I hope that's what's happening in your heart as we are teaching this, this anticipation of what's to come, because the Bible says that we are to comfort one another with these words. So the reason we're doing this is to comfort one another, to better understand what's to come, not to breed fear, but to comfort each other. So go with me. We're going to quickly look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. We've been looking at this passage as we teach on the rapture. It says this, verse 16. For the Lord himself, he will descend. I talked about in worship how Jesus ascended. This time he's going to descend from heaven with a shout. Say shout. I don't know about you, but I'm one of those parents when I go to the ball games that you know I'm there. How many parents do have like that, right? Woohoo! You know I'm in the house. You know I'm on the court or in the field, and my, and my kids are even like, oh man. But they kind of got over it, right? They're just like, stop coaching from the stands, mom. Stop it. But you know what? We know what a shout is humanly, but the shout that's going to happen the day Jesus comes through heaven is a literal battle cry. It's going to be a shout because a shout was what declared victory, right? The reason we go to a ball game and we're shouting is to cheer on our team because we want a what? A victory. And that's what's going to happen. So we're going to hear this massive shout, a victory cry, because Jesus, he conquered death, hell, and the grave. 
Go on with me. It says this, with a shout, with the voice of an archangel. What is an archangel? An archangel is one who announced the arrival of the king and kings of Lord of Lords all throughout the timeline, all right? So the archangel is going to announce it. And it says this, with the trump of God. Why a trumpet? I love a trumpet. Anybody play trumpet? Seriously? I love trumpet, all right? I was never, I was never talented like that. But I love trumpet. But a trumpet was used to announce royalty. So we're going to hear this massive blast, this trumpet that's going to sound. You're going to hear it if you go, all right? And it's going to sound, and it says this, the dead in Christ will rise first. Those who have accepted Jesus into their heart, but they have already passed away, all right? They had a real relationship with God. They're Stop. in the grave. How many of y'all have loved ones that loved God? They've passed. They're gone. Oh, think right. about it just for a moment. They're going to be raised up first. Right. First, I love that. First, and then we're going to be joined with them, and we're going to meet them in the air. I don't know about you. My dad re recently passed away this year. I can't wait. We're going to be reunited. We're going to be reunited. We're going to be reunited with those that we love, that loved God. We're going to see them again because our God is an eternal God. He's an eternal God. He's an everlasting God. There, it, there's no time with him. We will see our loved ones again. Isn't that encouraging today? That is so Isn't encouraging. Isn't that encouraging? Verse 17, then those who are alive, that's us, and those who remain shall be caught up. Say caught up. That word caught up is where we get the word rapture, and it literally means this. It's rapturo. It's herpazo, and, and it means to seize, to be caught up. Do we have it? Is our computer froze? I think our computer froze. But it means to be seized, to snatch away or to be caught up, to be carried from one place to another. So we are literally going to be caught up from this realm into the heavenly realm. It says this, verse 18, therefore comfort one another with these words. We talked about last week as we described what the rapture was, that it will happen in just a moment. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. Guys, this is a mystery. And you can study it and study it and study it and study it, and it's still a mystery, all right? But the Bible says that God has laid out every part of this mystery. He's already foretold what's going to happen. It says, We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. What does that word moment mean? We looked at this last week. Moment is the word atomos, and it means a millisecond. One, one millionth of a second. We will be changed. The reason we keep telling you we got to be ready is because when this moment happens, when that shout is heard, when the blast of the trumpet is heard, that one, one millionth of a second, there's no time to make anything right at that moment. You're either ready or you're not. You remember that game? Ready or not, here I come. There's not going to be a warning. This is our warning. And it's our job as believers who are ready to blow the trumpet now to warn those around us, not because we are crazy Jesus freaks, but because we love people. You understand that you're driven to tell people about Jesus and the fact that this is really the end times because we love people. If you love people, say amen. Amen. We love people. So last week in part two, we talked about what the rapture was. Today, in part three, we are extending this series because week one, we preached for over an hour. So we've extended it to cut down our messages, all right? So today we're talking about why a rapture. Next week, we're going to talk about when the rapture will happen, all right? Then we'll move on from there into tribulation and um, millennial reign, all right? Okay, so right now, if you're taking notes, and I really hope you are, um, we're just going to tell you the reason right now, why, why a rapture. We're going to tell you right now two reasons, and then we're going to spend the next few minutes as we close today explaining those two reasons in depth. Here's the two reasons. Reason number one, to unite us, the church, with Jesus, to be married to him, and to be with the Lord forever. That's reason number one, to reunite us to reunite us with Jesus, that we would be, if you would, married to him, and that we would be with him and the Lord forever. Reason number two is to deliver us from the wrath that is to come. We're going to talk about that. We touched on it last week. We're going to talk a little bit more about it here in just a moment. But reason number two, again, is to deliver us from the wrath that is coming, according to Revelation 6, 
and 16. All right, so let's look at this first point right here to reunite us with Jesus or unite us with Jesus. We talked a little bit at the end of last week's message. You know, we've kind of cut these and spread them out like Misty was saying. But we were talking at the end of last week's message about how there's so many passages of Scripture where Jesus is talking about the church, and he parallels us to, and metaphorically, to a bride. Uh, this is wedding language. You see it in so many different Gospels and, so, and, and much into the New Testament where Jesus is talking, and he refers to us as the bride of Christ. But we're going to start here in Ephesians chapter 5. And this is an interesting twist because here you have the writer, and he's talking about marriage, all right? And we're talking practical marriage between husband and wife. And, and let's look at chapter 5, verse 25. It says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. I want you to look at the capitalization of the word he. Anytime you see that, it's referring to God, all right, or Jesus. So we're talking about husbands. This means that they should love their wives just as Jesus loved the church. He, who's he? Jesus gave up his life for her. For who? Now he just switched gears. We're not talking about husbands and wives now. Now we're talking about Jesus and the church. He gave his life up because he loved us so much. He loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without spot or without wrinkle or any blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. So we're talking about marriage, and all of a sudden we shift gears, and we see that Jesus sees us as his bride. And here's, here's the picture that I want you to see. We're talking about being ready in this series. So what do we really mean by being ready? I want you to think about a bride and think about all, the whole process that goes into her being ready the day of her wedding. You guys ever seen Bridezilla? You ever seen her in action? I mean, the extent, right? You guys know the extent that a bride goes to to prepare. I mean, just think, think about all of the preparation that goes into that one day. Think about how early she gets up that day and how she needs uh, like a, a crew of people to help put on her makeup and fix her hair and help her put on one dress. And, and, and just all, all, all of the preparation that goes into getting what? Ready for that big moment. Now, now do, you, do you expect that, that in that moment, when the moment comes for that bride to be united with her groom, do you think she is going to be unaware of what time it is? Do you think she's going to be off somewhere distracted? Or is she going to be ready for her moment, ready for that time. She's been preparing and preparing and preparing. Some women I start dreaming as a little girl about the day that that will be and what it'll be like and what her dress will look like and the music and, and all of these thoughts, all of these preparations go into being what? Ready, ready for the moment where she will be united with her groom. God wants you and I to have the same anticipation in our hearts in our spirits as the church, that we would be ready, say ready, that we would be ready for the moment that comes when Jesus returns for his bride. Here's the problem. Is that so many times we cheat on God and we have an affair with our flesh and we chase after the things that please us. We prioritize in our lives our own plans, above the plans and above the purpose of God for which you were placed on this planet. The fact that you're breathing right now indicates that God has a purpose for your life. If his purpose was for you to just go to heaven, then the second you said yes to Jesus, you would be raptured out of here and you would go to heaven. If that's our purpose, that's not our purpose. That's our destination. Our purpose while we're on this planet is to spread hope. It's to know God, to have a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus that's what? Contagious. Our purpose is to know God Really know him and make him known. When you get to know God, hear me out, don't tune me out, listen. When you begin to know God, the closer you get to God, the more God 
requires of us that we become like him so we can have communion with him. We were made in the image and in the likeness of God. So God's desire for your life is that you would become as much like him as you possibly can while living this imperfect life. You'll never be perfect, but you serve a perfect God. And he wants you to strive to be just like him. So when you come to him, you begin to change the way you think. And your thinking changes the way you speak. And, and, and you begin to change the way you behave and the way you treat other people. And you will know a tree by its fruit. You'll begin to change and you'll become more like Jesus. And that's what he wants out of his bride. He doesn't want us to go on vacation and forget that he's coming back. He wants us to be ready. Say ready. He wants us to be ready, a, 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 a bride that is ready, that has prepared herself for the big day. He wants us to survey our hearts and our lives. He wants us to comb over ourselves with this great inspection, this evaluation that constantly and continually says, God, am I pleasing you with the life that I'm living? Am I really doing what you want me to do? Am I giving you my very, very, very best? Because you didn't hold anything back when you walked up to the cross and you hung yourself on there and you allowed your hands to be pierced with those nails in your feet with those nails you gave all and you're expecting me lord to just give all in the same are you giving him what he gave you are, are you living are you a living sacrifice holy set apart for him and acceptable that you would want to please god in everything you say do and think that's our desire as pastors, is to drill that into you, to inspire you to want to please God and to be a bride that's ready for him to return. You know, very, very practically, how do you do that? How do you get ready? We know what a bride does. How do you and I get ready? That scripture said that we were given the word to be cleansed by it. The only way you can prepare, the only way you can really be ready is, is if you're in this word. And I know that it can be intimidating because this is a big book, right? I mean, it, it, is, it can be intimidating. Sometimes you're reading things, you're like, I don't even fully understand what I'm reading. But can I tell you something? If you just make a habit of just saying, I'm going to take just a few moments. Around here, we like to just call it a 15-minute challenge. Just give God 15 minutes. And I encourage it to be the first 15 minutes, all right? And if you've been a believer for a long time, then I encourage you to go longer, all right? But at least 15 minutes, five minutes that you just turn on a worship song and get your mind in the right place, all right? Get, it, get your mind in God's presence. Five minutes of reading God's word because here's what's happening. When you begin to read God's word and you begin to align your life with it, you will see your own imperfections. How many can say amen to that? When you begin to get in the word of God, I begin to say, wow, Jesus loved like that? Man, I've got work to do. And you begin that day to say, well, then I'm going to work on that. I mean, one thing that I read so often is that we are to be thankful for everything, that we're not to grumble and complain. And then I go right out, and I'm like, gosh, it's so stinking cold out here. And I'm like, well, that's complaining. And I'm like, God, help me, right? And so even from the tiniest little things to the most giant, when we begin to read the word of God, we begin to align our life. And the more our attitude becomes like Jesus, the more our actions become like Jesus, the more we look in the mirror and go, man, I don't even recognize myself because you begin to align your life with the word of God. And that's why Jesus gave us the word to cleanse us. All right, let's go on quickly to the second reason for the rapture. It's to deliver us from the wrath that is to come. I'm going to take you through this fast. Revelations chapter 6, verses 15 through 17, it says this. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, catch this, every slave and every free man, pretty much everybody, okay? We could have substituted all of that for everybody, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us. They were like, take our life. Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. Who is the lamb? Jesus. All right? This says hide us from the wrath of the lamb. We're talking about the wrath that's getting ready to come down from Jesus. For the great day of wrath has come. Who can stand against it? Listen to me. The reason that we believe very clearly that the church is going to be raptured before the tribulation is because the wrath that's about to come is the wrath of the land. Now you tell me this. 
If Brad would have proposed to me and he would have said, Misty, I love you. I want to marry you. But before I marry you, I'm going to go away for seven years. And while I'm gone, I'm going to hand you over to the most wicked man on the planet. And he's going to do horrible things to you. But for seven years, you have to be with him. Then I'll come back and you will be with me. Does that sound very comforting to you? Does that sound like a creepy kind of groom? Yes. All right? Pretty crowd would have been like, no, thank you. No, thank you. Jesus is the lamb. He is going to come down and he's going to bring his wrath. But guys, that wrath wasn't intended for his bride. That wrath was intended for the Antichrist, the son of the Messiah, who is going to, to set himself up as the king of kings and lord of lords, though he's not. The wrath that's coming is because Jesus is going to put Satan in his place during that time. That's why we will be raptured. We will be rescued out of here. Now you say to yourself, man, I don't know. We talked about this, guys. Some people believe that we'll be raptured pre-trib. That's us, all right? Some people say, no, 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 no. We're going to go through the tribulation, but we're going to be preserved, okay? Some people say that. I'm going to show you some scripture in just a second. We're going to see what the word says. Some say, nope, it's at the end of the tribulation. I'm going to show you a scripture on that. Here we go. All right. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11 says this. Follow me. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. We know how quick that can happen. And they shall not escape. I want you to notice this. They shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness. He's talking to us. You that know Jesus, you are not in darkness so that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do. Don't let us get distracted with other things. Don't get caught not paying attention to the signs of the times. Exactly. But let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and a helmet of hope of salvation. Here's what I want you to notice. Take notice of this in verse 9. For God did not appoint us to, what does that say? Wrath. Who did I say was coming to bring wrath upon the earth during the tribulation? The Lamb. The wrath this of the Lamb. This passage says, We're not for appointed God to did it. not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain, obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. That whether we wake or whether we sleep, we should live with him. Verse 11, here we go again. Therefore, what's that word? Comfort each other and edify one another. That means build each other up just as you are doing. Guys, God did not appoint us to wrath. He did not, he did not intend for us to go through the tribulation. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm running out of time, so I want quickly. Oh, man. I know. Dang it. I got to read the rest of this. Hold on. Take me back. Okay, verse 11, I got to finish it. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as you are doing. God has not appointed us to wrath. He will come to take us from it like Sodom and Noah. We talked about this in part two. When the fire and the brimstone fell on Sodom, the people in the city, they were trapped. There was no way of escape. When the door closed on the ark, talked about this last week, the people outside of the ark were trapped with no way of escape escape. But listen, last week in the passage that we read, we talked about the fact that God warned, he told Noah, go into the ark, and he allowed him and his family to what? Escape. He had told them what was going to come. Lot, he literally said to Lot, you've got to go. Get your family, get your wife, get your kids, get out of this place because my wrath is going to be poured out upon Sodom and Gomorrah. He allowed them to escape. Now the wife, you know what she did? She looked back. She turned back. You can go back and you can read that story. Now go with me over to Luke quickly. Luke 21. I'm going to read 34 through 36. But God is the same God who rescued Lot from that destruction. He's the same God who rescued Noah. And he is the same God that is going to rescue us. Look at verse 34, Luke 21. It says, but take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing drunkenness and cares of this life. This is getting distracted. And that day will come upon you unexpectedly, for it will come as a snare on all of those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Go on to verse 36. 
So watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to, what's the word? Escape. Escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. You tell me this. Why would Jesus tell you and me to pray for something that could not happen? He told us to pray that we would escape, just like Noah escaped the wrath from the flood and just like Lot escaped the fire and brimstone that fell on Sodom and Gomorrah. You and I are to watch. We are to pray. We are to ready ourselves day in and day out to be ready. When Jesus splits that sky in one millionth of a second and he takes his bride, we are to pray that we would escape, that we would be ready. Amen. Amen. All right, so some people say... Hold on, i got to tell them this. This is so awesome. Esfuego Go for it. is the word escape. It means to leave a place. So if we're going to escape, it means we're literally going to leave. Be Take gone. me out, Jesus. So some people, some believers, believe that we will be raptured in the middle of the tribulation or towards the end of the tribulation, and they claim that belief, is, and it's okay to have a different opinion yeah. on how this is all interpreted. That's totally all right. Their belief, though, is that the Christians that are here will be protected from the power of the Antichrist, that they won't be harmed by all the curses. You know, the scripture says, I believe it's a, a third and then a fourth of all of humanity will die uh, in these curses that are unleashed on the planet. All of the sea life is going to die. All of the ocean life is going to die. Massive, massive uh, natural disasters, but a lot of humanity will actually die. But some believe, like I said, that the Christians that are here will be protected from all of that. So let's look and see what the word has to say. Okay, go to Revelation 13 and 5, and it says this. And the beast was allowed, this is the Antichrist, and the beast was allowed to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. He was, a, he was allowed, who allowed that? God himself. And how are the God holy people it. here if we've already been taken away from here? Because right. I promise you, if you're not ready and the rapture happens, you're going to be ready real you're fast. Get yourself ready then. When you see the church right. raptured away, yeah. I promise you, because you're going to have the knowledge here, right. but you didn't have the lifestyle to, to, to wow. live it out. Yeah. You're going to have the head knowledge, and immediately you are going to call out. You're going to cry out to God, because if we were to pull that timeline back up, you'll know in that moment you've got seven years of living hell on this planet, and you're going to get right with God. You're probably going to die and be beheaded in those seven years. But I promise you, we're going to have a whole lot of saints that are just going to appear all of a sudden because they're going to make their lives right with God because they missed the rapture. That's right. So let me finish this out. It says, and he was given authority to rule over every tribe and people and language and nation. This is for that set amount of time God has allowed that. Revelation 20 and 4 then says, and the Antichrist will behead those who do not take the mark of the beast. So though there will be many, many people, we talked about last week how there were 10 bridesmaids. Right? Five had oil ready to go. Five did not. Five went with the groom. Five did not. We're talking about an image of the church, and though it, it is not probably that exact percentage, there will be a large percentage of the church that when we are raptured out, a large percentage are left. But in that moment, you will begin to realize it was all true. There will be a lot of kids who grew up in Christian homes who maybe weren't living it at that moment who will be like, my mom and dad are gone and they were right. And they will get right in that moment. But then the only way that you are going to make heaven your eternal home is if you do not take the mark of the beast. Don't miss the week on the tribulation. You cannot take the mark of the beast. And if you do not, you will be beheaded. Now listen to me. So there's lots of passages that then talk about the fact that there's another rapture. A lot of times we get confused with the rapture that comes after the tribulation. I'm going to end with this scripture right here. Matthew 24, 29. It says this. Immediately following the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and all the tribes on earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven and the power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to another. This is the classic passage where most people will say, see, this is the rapture. This is the second rapture. This is the second coming. And there is a group of people who are going to go in that moment, and those people are the ones who were beheaded. Those who died during the tribulation, those who gave their life to Jesus during the tribulation and were beheaded, Jesus will rapture them in 
that moment. This is the second rapture. It's the second coming. Some scholars believe that also God will gather at that time those who, before Christ ever came to earth as a human being, those who died before Christ, um, Old Testament saints, they didn't have Jesus' blood to call on. They, didn't call on. they weren't able to call on Jesus as Messiah. They didn't even know who Jesus was. Uh, a lot of scholars believe at that time that those who, God is ultimate judge. He judges the heart. He's going to judge those people, and he's going to bring those who he's calling to heaven um, to be a part of that second rapture, that, that, end time, that second coming of Christ. Right. As we close today, maybe you've heard the scripture that says, broad is the way that leads to destruction, and narrow is the way that leads to everlasting life. This is why we are preaching so hard and heavy through this series. We want you, the church, to be ready. And we want you to know that there is a lot of believers that will not go in the rapture. Now, I notice, quote, unquote, there are a lot of people who think that they're right, maybe because they prayed a prayer of salvation, but their heart, their lifestyle isn't matching up with the confession of their faith. And so, as your pastors, man, this is our heart cry that you would know what it means to have a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus. So you're not part of, of that, that broad way that is led to destruction, but that you really know who Jesus is, and you're part of that narrow way, that group that makes the rapture, and we make heaven our home. We love you guys. We want you to be ready. We want your family members to be ready. We want your neighbors to be ready. We want to fill heaven to the full with people who know what hope is and who hope is. His name is Jesus. So today, again, this is our favorite part of every message. We want to give you an opportunity. If you have not received Jesus as your Savior, we want to give you that opportunity right now. If you would bow your heads with me and close your eyes. It's a confession of faith. It's, it's admitting that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. It's asking God to forgive you of your sins, and it's believing Jesus is who he says he is. He's the son of God. It's confessing him as Lord of your life. So if you're watching online today, I'm talking to you. If you're in this house, I'm talking to you. Have you made that decision? If Jesus were to return right now, would you be ready? Would you escape the wrath that is to come? We want you to be ready. With heads bowed, eyes closed. If you want to be ready and you want to pray this prayer together as a church today, if you're online, you're watching, I want you just to type all in. All in in the comment section below. And we're going to connect with you later this week. We're going to help you to take the next step to following Jesus. If you're in this house today, I want you just to raise your hand in this house. And we're going to pray with you right where you are. If that's you and you feel in your heart you're not ready, would you just raise your hand at this time? And we're going to pray with you in the church. Thank you, Father. Let's pray this prayer together for those in support of those who are making this decision, this decision. Father, I love you. Forgive me of my sins. Jesus is the Son of God. I confess him as Lord of my life. Help me to be ready and to escape the wrath to come. In Jesus' name.